In the late hours of September 6, 2017, a Category 5 hurricane named Irma passed nearby the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico, a small island in the Caribbean. Within 24 hours, more than 1 million residents were without power, without drinkable water, and were struggling to establish contact with the outside world. Days later, another storm was on the horizon, this one changing the island forever. That storm was called Maria, and it hit straight on, laying waste to the already bruised and ailing infrastructure. The storm of Maria's intensity hadn't directly hit the island in almost eight decades. The island was now in trouble in a way that it hadn't ever been before. My name is Will Potter. I'm an investigative journalist, TED Fellow, and a professor at the University of Michigan. Almost a year after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, a lot is still unanswered. How many people died? What is the real status of the infrastructure? How is the island coping? We put together a team from the university's Office of Academic Innovation and went to Puerto Rico to investigate for ourselves. What we found both clarified and complicated the narrative that we'd become accustomed to hearing. We had read a lot about the storms and the destruction in advance, but there is nothing like witnessing such things for yourself. This is a personal reflection on what we experienced. We began in San Juan, the capital. It was to be our hub for our stay here. We stayed in the resort district on the border of old San Juan one of the oldest cities in the United States, dating back to the 1500s. Even in the area designated for a global tourism industry, the place still had the air of destruction and slow rehabilitation. I can only imagine how much worse it looked almost a year ago. As we explored, we found that even the luxury businesses were not immune to the power of the storms. It's been almost a year since Hurricane Maria, and still the signs of the hurricane and the destruction are everywhere. Even in the most affluent areas, which sometimes had the access to power more quickly, they were also the hardest hit. So street by street and block by block, you can still see that lucrative businesses were not necessarily even able to recover. As we wandered around the metropolitan blocks, we were shocked to find that even 10 months later, traffic lights were still out. This was a rampant problem across all of San Juan, leading to many close calls and stressed moments behind the wheel. For the people living here, this is the new normal. So Benjamin, you, uh, nearly every intersection has been without power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting coming up to these intersections. You look up there, that one doesn't have power. It's kind of a free for all. It reminds me of traveling in Ethiopia or other places that just don't have the infrastructure in terms of the roads. Right? So everybody just kind of does. <laughs> you do the best you can and figure it out. Just try not to run into something or get hit. The infrastructure of Puerto Rico has received plenty of media coverage. I've heard about private companies swooping in, hoping to profit in the revitalization. Most things are now back online, but some communities are still running off of gas-powered generators. That obviously isn't a permanent solution, and I wonder when some of these places will be able to cut that temporary cord in place of a new strategy. The history of this island has come up a lot in our early conversations. The brutal, colonial nature of its takeover, multiple times, has now weaved its way into the identity of the citizens. Pushing back against the status quo and not allowing others to dictate your future is something I certainly can identify with but this was a side of the island I was just not prepared for. We're in the Tras Tayeras neighborhood of San Juan in Puerto Rico, and we had to stop because this is something that's been looming over all of our conversations, this legacy of colonialism in San Juan, in Puerto Rico. And I mean, it doesn't get more striking than that of 
you know, the uh, Columbus and the ships coming in and having this wake of dead bodies behind them. And as we're talking to people, they're routinely describing Hurricane Maria was a tragedy, but it was a, a tragedy on a much longer timeline and with a much longer uh, legacy. And you can't isolate it from that past. And this is just one reminder in the neighborhoods that we're going through of how it's constantly above us and, and surrounding us. The aftermath of Irma and Maria was all around even this long after the storm. From the air as well as the ground, it was abundantly clear that parts of this island remained a mess. It made me wonder if and when all of this would be cleaned up. It was humbling to walk through areas that looked like the storm had hit just 24 hours ago. Devastation after Hurricane Maria is just omnipresent. I mean, it was there before the hurricane in a lot of areas of the island. And now, post Maria, how do you rebuild? Um, a conversation that's kind of continuing with a lot of the people we're speaking with is, you know, to quote the clash, should I stay or should I go? It's they're seeing friends and people, family, people who can afford it are going to mainland United States or elsewhere. Um, and if not, you either rebuild or you kind of acclimate to the disaster. I mean, this has become the norm. It was hard to understand why things so much later were still so broken. Why weren't the authorities or municipalities cleaning this up? Is this what New Orleans, Houston, Miami, and New York looked like a year later? I wasn't there, but something tells me this place looks far worse than any of those. My suspicions were being confirmed every time we stopped the car to film or conduct an interview. But through all of this hardship, the strength of the island came through. What's been so striking, just talking to people and walking around is how incredibly resilient everyone has been. I mean, across uh, class and background. I mean, we see this graffiti or, you know, mural over here, the stand up for Puerto Rico. And that's really been kind of the, the spirit. I mean, when we're talking to people, they're really emphasizing the good work that's being done. Um, communities coming together. Uh, you know, we have construction crews in the streets, in the rain, people just doing everything they can, you know, getting generators working, helping each other out. I mean, it's been really striking. We traveled across much of San Juan finding stories of continued ruin and resolution, of perpetual despair and hopeful resilience. These stories were everywhere and it was difficult to figure out what to even attempt to cover. Through some of our University of Michigan contacts, we were able to line up a conversation with the doctor in San Juan, who's been on the ground treating patients and victims since day one. His name is Dr. Ivan Figueroa. Dr. Figueroa invited us to meet at his clinic and offered to drive me around the Central Medical District. Media reports led us to believe that the hospitals were back online and that people could be treated once again. We learned that this was not the whole story and we were not prepared for what he was about to show us. Okay, le voy a dar un pequeño paseo por el área de lo que es centro médico medicina forense, que fue la área más crítica que, que sufrió, porque aquí era que llegaban los cadáveres, los enfermos, de todo Puerto Rico tenían que venir ¿Solamente? aquí. ¿Solamente? Sí, solamente hay un centro médico, uh -huh. solamente hay un eh, edificio de medicina forense. Ok, como ven viendo, ese es el edificio. Está rodeado por un río, uh -huh. que cuando llovía se salía el río. Y ahí van a ver ahora los trailers donde se acumulan los cadáveres todavía. Uh, the, all of the yeah. cadavers. Todos. Ajá. Uh -huh. Here. Se, se supone que en cada... ¿Hoy? Sí, yeah, en cada furgón uh. hay aproximado 50. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. Three hundred. Today. Three hundred bodies. Yeah. Today, just yeah. sitting right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the trucks. Yeah. Con el huracán, había 15, 15 eh, uh -huh. troces ahí. 15, furgones. And, and uh, para, <laughs> so it's familias. Yeah. Uh, you know, or, 
Mira la calle. La calle estaba rodeada uh -huh. de militares uh -huh. con M16 para custodiarlo. Todo esto estaba militarizado, completo. For the, just because of the bodies. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, este es el edificio que está cerrada la calle todavía. Mm. Por aquí vamos hacia el centro médico. Las calles están destrozadas todavía. How had we not heard about these containers? How was this not a larger story? A cursory drive-by was not enough. The military guards are now long gone and the fences had fallen over. This place I looked forgotten. We needed to finish our tour and return to the container site to investigate more. We're here in the central medical district of all of Puerto Rico. And we had a guided tour of the neighborhood. The preeminent cancer facility in all of the Caribbean is here and it's been shut down for the entire Caribbean. The, the clinics, the uh, people have just abandoned their homes, the veterans hospital, all shut down. Business, 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 all shut down. On top of that, one of the just great shames, I think, of this entire humanitarian crisis is behind us. These trailers are full of the bodies of some of the victims of the hurricane. Part of the problem and how this happened was that, again, this being the medical district, there are bureaucratic issues about autopsies and cremations. There was one facility to handle this with the autopsy, one facility to get the death certificates. The bodies just kept piling up and they're still here. Over 300, but still in truck trailers. You can hear the fans whirring behind us, obviously to keep this from uh, becoming a, an even greater public health issue, but they're just in these innocuous trailers that might have been used on another day to ship medical supplies, but the hospitals and the pharmacies are closed down, and now they're full of corpses. So today was our first full day of interviewing and filming here in Puerto Rico. And I have to say, it really caught me off guard. I mean, we did a ton of research and as kind of dumb as it sounds, I still didn't really grasp the magnitude of what we're talking about and, and really of why we're here, you know, just to be blunt like my career as a journalist i've covered a lot of really dark stuff and a lot of really you know dangerous and uh, you know psychologically kind of unmooring places you know you build up a pretty thick skin but what i want to talk about in particular is the the conversations that we had with um, a doctor and going through the really the central medical area of Puerto Rico. For instance, the main hospital, not just in Puerto Rico, but in all of the Caribbean for cancer treatment is shuttered. I mean, it's closed. The veterans hospital is closed. And I will never forget uh, today driving around with the doctors who's just dedicated his life to his community. You know, everyone knows him you know he was sh showing us all the hospitals and pharmacies and everything that's just been shut down or you know still without power and non-functional and then we came to a series of nondescript trailers they could hear a hum coming from because they had fans and some kind of a cooling unit connected to them and he said that's where there's about 300 bodies of people that have died since the hurricane. I don't think I would have noticed if he hadn't taken us there. And I don't know if I would have believed it, you know, and kind of a visceral 
emotional, personal way of truly understanding that this is happening if I didn't see the mass disaster printed on the side of the trailers and I haven't seen it covered at all. I mean, I just immediately thought of my partner and our boys and dear friends and, you know, that's where your mind goes. And like, if I, if this was my home and I had been through Hurricane Maria and I had lost people I care about, I don't know if I, I don't know what I could do knowing that that just hadn't, there's no resolution to it. I think it's a, an international shame. I don't know how else to describe it. It is a fundamental lack of respect for people's basic human dignity. The federal government has failed people here. The United States has failed uh, the people here. The international community has failed uh, the people here. So has the local government. At one point in an interview, um, it was said, after about the third week, this uh, kind of terror set in of, wow, no one's coming. No one's coming. And we wouldn't, that wouldn't happen to Washington, D.C., or New York, or Houston, or L.A. I mean, I just... I can't see a circumstance, you know, in which that would pass, but that's the reality here. All the stories that we heard today that I will never forget, um, they are coupled with this, you know, kindness from people and um, a generosity of spirit. And I mean, it was truly moving. Anyway, back at it tomorrow. reached out to FEMA for an official explanation. After our shocking and eye-opening day with Dr. Figueroa, we felt it was worth pursuing. I wanted to ask one of the lead officials on the ground about these containers. Why on earth were they still sitting here? We made the call and found out that they agreed to be interviewed, but refused to sign a release form required by the university. This seemed a bit odd, and our legal department wanted to know why. We felt like we were playing a game of telephone in the shadow of the State Department's presence here on the island. Maybe this yes to questions but no to release was a tactic for us to just cut our losses and not follow up. They later agreed to the interview but refused to put anything in writing. They were trying to force our hand. Okay, bye-bye. So what just happened? So she basically just said, um, since uh, the interviewee is a, pu is, this is her verbiage, not mine, is a public figure, he doesn't feel comfortable signing the waiver. And he, and she used the word adamant. They're adamant that he's not going to sign the waiver. Um, but she, but at the same time, she said, you can totally use any footage for whatever you want. So right. It's <laughs> nonsense. I mean, and what's the concern? Yeah, I mean, okay. that was, wasn't answered. So and, I think with this verbal agreement. We're good to go. Yeah, he ba uh, they basically said, we've never had to do this for CNN or other news bureaus, so we don't want to do it for this. Right. Which just feels strange, but okay. Uh, you know, yeah. that we just got the verbal, you know, uh, verbal agreement or verbal consent yeah. that you can use it for whatever you want. That's what she said, she right? Said, right. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So whatever. Okay, we're good to go. Um, so that's actually it right over there. And you can see the, the federal logo. I think there's a lot of uh, frustration. I'm wondering, you know, both as a, in your professional capacity and as a Puerto Rican, when you see those kind of roadblocks, um, especially those just jarring, you know, the, the corpses in these trucks. I mean, what's your kind of uh, well, I mean, emotional response to well, that? Well, let me tell you this. In Puerto Rico, we have a hate crime and elite rate. So a lot of the bodies that, we, that you see might be related to criminality, not related to the hurricane. The other Do thing we is know that, that? Well, that, that's something that you need to talk to the state because we don't get involved in that. We assist them and, re and reimburse them. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically what we do is we take whatever the state certifies 
and then we process that according to what the state certifies. So if the state certifies that there's X amount of numbers, we will take each and every one of the cases and we will contact that family and process reimbursement for funeral expenses. That's as far as we take that. And it's all over the nation like that. So the fact that we're actually providing them some support, because in, if you think about the hurricane when, when it came in, uh, we didn't have power. So right. all the morgues, uh, all the morgue, as well as all the funeral homes that we had throughout the island, lost the power. But now, you know, when we're coming up on 10 months later, mm -hmm. uh, that's been quite a bit of time. And also, you know, in, in all of your 30 years experience, have you seen a situation like that before, either in the U.S. or in Virgin Islands yeah, or we, elsewhere? We have problems in Katrina like that. We have problems with the in, bodies kind of stacking up like this. Bodies that were actually there, because the other thing that you have to do is you have to ask them how many of those bodies were related to the hurricane and how many of those bodies are beyond those. How many of those bodies? You have to ask those questions. You cannot make an assumption that well, those bodies are for hurricanes. Right, and, and I, I think. Keep those, those questions to Right. Mm -hmm. right. So for the FEMA response, though, when we're talking about power and because um, what you said in your in your response, that was really a core mm -hmm. problem that mm -hmm. you the, the power went out. We're not able to handle this. Um, does FEMA have a, a role then of trying to assist in in that kind of infrastructural and public health system uh, but of recovery? Course. But of course. 67 hospitals in Puerto Rico that are all private and we provide the generation support and fueling them and we fuel them for six or seven months. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the centers for diagnosis and treatment in the whole island that we were providing generation and fuel. And then we had close to about 400 health and, hu and social ser and human services uh, corps that came in. Right. We provided hospitals. Uh, we provided two, med two medical hospitals from the arm uh, DOD. Uh, we actually had movement of patients uh, by helicopter, by hel helicopter ambulances. Uh, so indeed, and then the actual uh, trailers that you see was us providing them for overflow for the, mm -hmm. for the patients that they have. But this is all based on requests that they have for us. Okay. And so right now we, we, we ended up treating probably about 33,000 patients in Puerto Rico at the time of the disaster. We had the largest deployment of health and human services personnel in the history of FEMA. Mm -hmm. We had the comfort going around, moving patients around, just to maintain the overflow and to actually decompress the whole system of a medical system in Puerto Rico. I mean, we got this interview with FEMA, the head of the crisis response for all of FEMA. Uh, he's also a Puerto Rican native. He's been in uh, 200 and something deployments for FEMA, 30 years and the folks on our team just really hustled and made it happen. First of all, you know, they gave us 15 minutes with FEMA for this interview, which, you know, I'm grateful for any time. They asked for pre-submitted questions, which uh, our team supplied uh, very quickly. And I, however, do not want to follow. It's not what journalism is. You don't, you, you know, we're not giving a survey to FEMA with certain questions. Um, you know, so we jumped through the hoop. Tito was very, very focused on just rattling off as many numbers as possible. Statistics, and he said that 99.6% uh, percent of the island has power again, which is funny because today was a lot of driving and all the stoplights were out. He and FEMA were emphasizing that, you know, all these problems existed before the hurricane. So he said it's not FEMA's responsibility about the bodies and the shipping containers um, because that was a problem and there has been a lot of crime before the hurricane. Um, I asked him about this sentiment I'm hearing from everyone about the outrage, the, um, the hopelessness, uh, the feeling that the United States has just given up on so much of the country. Um, and he described it as noise. All the PR uh, handlers uh, quite nervous. They interjected once to say that I'm not allowed to ask about that um, when I was asking about the bodies. And, you know, we kept asking and he, you know, kept talking about it. Um, then more PR people or others with FEMA started showing up. Uh, and there's a lot of back and forth conversation and a lot of, uh, you know, trying to stop the interview. And Sean, to his credit, uh, on our team, waved him away a couple times, and you know I kept talking, and they backed off, which I kind of got a kick out of, I have to say. But it was also it was telling because uh, the FEMA people 
were recording with an iPhone, just, you know, audio, as we were doing the interview, but recording, like, you know, sticking it right almost in, in camera shots, so, like, right here, that was completely just an intimidation harassment move. This has been, a, a, you know, a pivotal moment, for sure, being on this trip. I'm going to bed. Uh, Puerto Rico, day two. We needed to see more of Puerto Rico. The team hit the road early and went south into the central mountains of the island. This is an area that was severely affected by the hurricanes. These are small villages that were already isolated from the larger cities, but the damage to the roads, landslides, unclean water, and no electricity for months effectively cut this part of the map from the rest of the world. We had heard of a University of Michigan student assisting with relief efforts even all these months later. His name was Amilcar and was in the center of the island, near a small town called Oracovis. On our way there, we stopped at a local grocery store to see what an area that had been brutalized by the storms looked like now. People are telling us that in the days and weeks after, all these shelves were empty. All the produce was rotting. If you were prepared and you did truly appreciate the gravity of the hurricane, you stocked up on canned goods and you were more lucky, but otherwise people had nothing. Um, so now things are starting to come back, but it's still a great disparity between the more urban areas in San Juan or the more affluent areas, and now we're getting more central uh, into the mountains and into the jungle. Amilcar had helped organize a building and restoration mission for a family who lived on a cliff off of the main road. Their house had been devastated during the last hurricane season and afterwards, FEMA came in to assist in the relief efforts. FEMA provided funds intended to build a new house, but the money wasn't enough and construction ceased after building just a concrete and rebar structure at the foot of their previous home. The reasons this structure was only half built were purely bureaucratic and the family needed more assistance in at least getting prepared for the upcoming storm season. Their wallless, floorless feature house did have a current use though. It was where they parked their Jeep. The rain never stopped when we were there and the mud flowed down the hills into what would one day be their living room. The homeowners, Jose and Maria, were enormously grateful for the effort expended by the university team. I found their names interesting as they were also the names of two of the season's largest hurricanes, one of which destroyed their home. Electricity took months to get back online this far inland, with Jose and Maria's house only getting power a few weeks before we arrived. All of this building would have been nearly impossible without that power being restored. We're up here in the uh, up in the mountains, what everyone calls the heart of Puerto Rico, and you can see why. I mean, everyone has been incredibly nice and welcoming, even as, you know, a uh, crew of white guys with camera gear and a SUV driving around. I mean, people have, in the grocery store everywhere are super welcoming and friendly. Uh, you can see behind me is the, the road we came in on, and I don't even think that was the worst part. I mean, there are some... Uh, as a, a motorcycle guy, I was kind of like, this would be a blast, all the switchbacks, and then I was like, actually, no, <laughs> this is kind of terrifying. You know, access uh, is definitely a problem. Um, down at the bottom of this is where uh, the house is that everyone's working on, and believe it or not, this that I hiked up here as I think supposed to be a road. Uh, it looks like clearly car tread uh, that's in the mud. So some brave soul uh, made it up. And I don't see like many other parts of Puerto Rico, people have just kind of abandoned vehicles that got damaged. And I'm not seeing remnants of a Jeep. So, you know, hopefully they got to where they were going. We lent a hand when we could, but felt like we were really just getting in the way. We decided to make the trek back to the coast. I wish them good luck on their journey out of this bureaucratic nightmare which had enveloped them for almost a year. 
I can only hope that this season is easier on the island's interior. I'd be thinking of Jose and Maria tonight. The end of the day and the end of our assignment coincided with an annual event called La Noche de San Juan. I'd seen images of this celebration before online, but I didn't know what to expect. The police presence was heavy with the helicopter circling overhead. It was part beach party, part sacrament, with those revelers washing away the previous year by wading into the ocean and then dunking themselves three times at midnight. This is meant to cleanse the soul and to protect the next 12 months from bad luck. It felt like a lot of people were washing away the hurricanes, washing away the terror and the heartache, the ongoing tragedy, and hoping that they would be spared this season. We spoke to some of the people on the beach about what the last year was like for them. The residents of Puerto Rico were so kind and welcoming with all of the questions we asked. And after our time here, we wanted to partake in the ritual ourselves. The water was warm and the atmosphere got to us. We would never know what it was like to live through what everyone here has. But in that moment, we felt the collective solidarity of the island. As we dried off and left the beach, one of the people we talked to earlier ran after me to show me something. He pointed down at his phone and told me to watch a video of a sewage pipeline being opened and running into the ocean. This was like an hour before we all went in, he said, just a half mile down the road from us. We were just swimming in that. This is what we're dealing with here. I thought you should see this. This kind of summed up a lot about what we had seen on the island. Just at the moment of progress or advancement, something happens that resets you and you have to start all over again. But the dark waters that flooded this island in September of 2017 were pushed back and defeated by the resilience of the Puerto Rican people. Their bravery and courage have been on permanent display since the founding of the old city, but it's now found new challenges. An economic depression, political corruption, rising seas and a worsening climate, to name just a few. The uncertain future that hangs over this beautiful island is tempered by the hopeful and tenacious spirit of all who live here.